All right, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces, friends, families. Um, it's great to have you with us today. Um, I can't um, tell you how much we are glad that you are here, all of you are here to celebrate um, with us today. Um, I just have a um, um, few short things to say, and then I also will um, read a greeting from um, Superintendent Rhodes, if my wife will bring that envelope up, with, up to me that I left back at the soundboard. <laughs> Can never trust the sound guy. Um, I'd like to share, it's on the left side, it's on the left side, Sharon, thank you. I'd like to share a, a short um, verse here um, to start. This is Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. That was all part of this. Um, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, Christ's church are not, is not these physical walls, but, um, but the people that have filled, that, I'm sorry, but the, but the people that have been filled with the Holy Spirit um, and that have indwelled here, indwelled here is what is Christ's church. Um, and so I have a brief uh, story of history for you that you can fill me in at the end later on, after our service today, our meeting today, to tell me where I'm, why I might have messed things up or have it wrong. But um, so, um, um, as I was saying, you know, Christ Church is is the people that are that are here, filled with the Holy Spirit and and, and indwelled here. So let's start it um, at the beginning. Let's see. Oh yeah, a hundred years ago. Um, there, there, 100 years ago, there was a charter that was started at a small church. Um, well, I shouldn't say, I'm not even sure if it was at this church at all, um, but it's a small charter that was started that then grew into a society um, and, in, and it was met at, the church, um, at a church on the corner of Marshall and Hilton. Um, and at one point, it became... Uh, known that it was that that was no apparent it was apparent that they needed a larger facility and so forgive me if I just continue to read my notes here um, it was at that time that a plan was put in place for this building which 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 for it was at that time that there was a plan put in place for this building excuse me in order to move forward with that plan a loan was needed from a bank a bank that would not approve the loan with some, without some sort of collateral. The land, this, this land, um, was not valuable in itself to provide that collateral. After some time of prayer and discussion among themselves and their families, 10 men associated as trustees and um, board members and or board members co-signed the loan in the range of up to $5,000 a piece. And at that time, um, that was the amount of money that was one third of their homes, one, for, one third of the price of their homes. And so um, they co-signed the loan and with um, the thought that if something went wrong, that their mortgage, their home, would be put up as as, um, for the bank to rec recover their money. <clears throat> but the Lord was faithful. The loan was never delinquent. And so this, this building became uh, a place of worship. Um, it's, a peop it's, the, it's the people, the families, the friends that the Lord has brought here. Um, the way he has led in their lives and his faithfulness that has has and will make this up this church here at FMC. And so that is, is, um, stands with our, our, um, our, our banner there. In perfect faithfulness, the Lord has done many marvelous things. And I, and I, I cannot do anything but more but to say that emphatically. I've, intent, I've attended here my entire life. I accepted the Lord as my Savior right here at this altar. Um, I met my wife here. <laughs> um, 
I started wooing her in kindergarten, but it, it, it never really took effect until later on in life. Uh, um, my children were dedicated here, some of my children's as, children as well. I know that some of you, for some of you, um, many of you share these same experiences. And so again, in perfect peace, faithfulness, in perfect faithfulness, the Lord has done many marvelous things, and I'm thankful for him, to him for these things. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to read then now the, um, the greeting from pa uh, Superintendent Rhodes. <clears throat> Dear friends, greetings in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord of the church. Due to, due to denominational responsibilities this week, I am um, unable to attend sig this, this significant celebration of your church's centennial. However, Pastor Rob was kind enough to include a brief word from me forwarding my hearty congratulations for this significant milestone. <clears throat> the Southern Michigan Network of Churches is grateful to God for the partnership between all of our churches across the decade, across the decades. In addition, your congregation has served an important role within the larger Free Methodist domination. Significant contributions of financial giving to world missions, as well as significant numbers of disciples and leaders have also emerged from this congregation who served without, served within our movement. Your church has made an, an eternal impact upon the kingdom through these years. As your, thanks, as your thanksgiving to God is poured out in the spirit of celebration this weekend, might your vision for the future be strengthened and may your courage to move forward under the leadership of God's spirit increase. Together, all the churches can partner together to ignite a spirit fuel fueled movement of kingdom work, work assigned to you as, your lab as you labor to the, for the master. It's good, to be it's good to belong, Superintendent Bruce Rhodes, Southern Michigan Conference. So. All right, so at this, at this time, I'd like to introduce our children's pastor, uh, Laura Riddle, and she's going to unpack the rest of our service for us as, a, as our MC. I'm going to take this up here because I'm not as tall as Mr. Dave. Um, so our first speaker here, his name is Jacob Tenney, and he has a long history with Ferndale Free Methodist Church. He was carried through the doors of this church the first time he came. Today we let him walk. Um, he did his growing up in the congregation, and Jacob served as our youth pastor alongside his wife, Heather, from 2010 to 2016. Jacob received his master's in divinity from Asbury Seminary in 2020 and is now working on his doctorate in intercultural studies. Uh, he recently was appointed to the Committee of Free Methodist History and Archives, and he welcomes the opportunity to uh, share some of Ferndale's rich past. So would you join me in welcoming Jacob Tenney? It's been a long time since I've stood up here. Um, I get to talk to Bryce about um, what it's like to do the things that I used to do, because he does them now. Um, and I used to sit over there and do them as well. And it's just, and this is part of what we're gonna talk about today, but it is such a sweet thing to be able to be part of the body of Christ for a long time, to be part of a community that you can go away from for a little bit and come home and still feel like it's home. And I am grateful for the testimony of this church. And we're gonna talk about what that testimony is and why it's important to be able to remember it. And some of the things that we may have forgotten are worth remembering. And so I have here the way that I'm gonna talk about today, mining the past to shape the future. And this is, for Free Methodist's 100 year anniversary. As Laura said, I grew up in this church and I was talking with my parents, um, I was here last night, and they asked me, uh, you know, cause I come up like once a year and they asked me, so what was it like this time? And I said, it's the same as every time. Like I walked through those doors and it kind of just felt like I didn't leave. Um, I walked down the hallway and I can remember being significantly younger and playing tag until it was time to go home. For me, that was much later than everybody else because my mom stayed very late. And so I got a lot of fun in. Um, but this is 
undeniably the second home that I will always remember throughout my life. And so to be able to unpack the history of this church and what it meant to me, but also what it's meant to the countless amount of people that have sat in these very seats for over 100 years is an honor. And I, I pray that for all of us, it would continue to be an honor. And so I'm just going to open the word in prayer um, so we can understand that this is, a, this is holy ground that we sit on. Not because it is four walls that we call a church, but we are the church and we get to do this together. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, what a gift it is to celebrate the things that you do, the things that you have done and the things that you'll continue to do. Lord, as we enter into remembering our past, I pray that it would bridge us with joy and passion and zeal towards the future. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. So, I'm going to start off with why would church history even be important? What, what is the value of being able to go back and look at all these different things that might have happened in the past? This quote um, I came across, and I think it's a helpful one. The function of history in the church's service of God is not to root us in the past, but to help us to understand ourselves and our situation so that we may be faithful now to God's calling, to root us more deeply in the history-making love of God in Christ. This banner that we have across here is from Isaiah 25. In the context of, of this the chapter of Isaiah 25 is, is the people of Israel really struggling with impending doom that was coming. And in the midst of some really hard things, there's this psalm of praise. And the first words that we hear are these gifts back to God, this praise back to God. And so we hear the psalmist in Isaiah say, God is exalted for his wonderful things, right? These marvelous things, which are the great divine acts of salvation. Sometimes supernatural, but sometimes not. Revealing the hand of God at work on Israel's behalf. The psalmist is aware that the intervention of God is not accidental, but follows a divine plan. Thus demonstrating his faithfulness and constancy. Ferndale Free Methodist Church is a testimony to the good gifts that God continues to give. Are the gifts always apparent? They are not. Are there hard times? There most certainly are. Are there reasons to celebrate through it all? Absolutely. And that's why we're here today. This is a really, really long quote, and it might be too small for you to read, but it's also very important because it gets to the very core of what we're gonna talk about a little bit more. And that is the reason that we gather in a church at all. It's because of the good news of Jesus Christ. Full stop. There's no other reason for us to be here. Jesus is alive and well, and we get to follow him day by day. And what is the gospel? I'm gonna read you this quote. The good news is that the one true God has now taken charge of the world, in and through Jesus and his death and resurrection. God has grasped the world in a new way to sort it out and fill it with his glory and justice as he always promised. The ancient sickness that has crippled the whole world and humans with it has been cured at last so that the new life can rise up in its place. Life has come and is pouring out like a mighty river into the world in the form of a new power, the power of love. The good news was and is that all this has happened in and through Jesus. That one day it will happen completely and utterly to all of creation. And that we humans, every single one of us, whoever we are, can be caught up in the transformation here and now. This is the Christian gospel. Do not allow yourself to be fobbed off with anything else. This was a British guy, so I don't know what that means, but I think we can fill it in. Um, that is the gospel. That is the reason that we, Free Me Ferndale Free Methodist Church, celebrate. Not because we have a cool building, but we do. Not because we did a lot of really cool programs, we did. But because of Jesus. But because of Jesus. 
So, with that said, let's start at the beginning. In 1922 is when the seed of free Methodism was planted in Ferndale through cottage prayer meetings. This is a really, really old term that you're going to find in a lot of old literature. Basically what it means is little house churches. People meeting in each other's family rooms and praying together. Earnestly trying to figure out what Jesus was doing in them, through them, and the places that they were at. But you may ask, what does Ferndale look like in 1922? Well, here's a couple of pictures. I don't know if you can see these very well, but this is the interchange of Nine Mile and Woodward in 1920s. All right? So we've got some paved road because Woodward is one of the first paved roads in the whole world. Um, but that's about it. Um, there's not much happening. It was still not a city yet. Pretty sure it was a village. Um, and its first mayor came later in the 1920s. So Ferndale does not exist in the way we think it might in our minds. Currently, the place that we're residing in the 1920s was called Urban Rest. It was a, uh, like a getaway from the city. Um, and there were some cottages that you could rent in these very areas. Um, also, it was very swampy. And so that's the gift of Ferndale. Um, but as we look into what was some of the early things that really defined um, what it meant to be Free Methodist at Ferndale Free Methodist, I found some things that are interesting. And so I'm going to share those things. There are lots of very interesting things that have happened throughout the course of our history, but I'm choosing three. Um, we can all talk about others after, but for these few minutes that I have, I want to share three things that I think are very important for the future of this church because they happened in the past. So first off, if you were walking down the hallway and you saw the list of lead pastors that were um, given their headshots as you walked in, towards the very front, they didn't have pictures, but there were two names that had a feminine quality to them. Well, it's because they were women. Um, and this is significant because Interestingly enough, they stop after that. We have not had a woman leader since the late 1920s. Even further than that, the Free Methodist Church did not ordain women until 1974. This is all very interesting because when it comes to starting churches, women did that, and they did it well. So let's talk about that, all right? We have this first gal, her name was Luella Manning Heltzel. She came in in 1926, but she didn't just come in from out of nowhere. By this time, she was about 40 years old. She had um, just finished up home missionary work. And so she went around to urban areas with the Salvation Army and lived in the dire situations and ministered to people who were on the fringes of society. After that, she went to Spring Arbor College and worked as a dorm leader for young women there. After that, she was given the opportunity in a supply role, because she was not allowed to be lead pastor, in a supply role to lead this church. So as you can see, this is the Ferndale Gazette in 1926. And it's, it's an advertisement for the churches in the area. And there's Luella's name right there, pastor. No differentiation. She's our pastor, right? The gravestone over here is in Spring Arbor right now. And you can't read it, but etched in the stone, it says, Luella Heltzel, God's handmaid. She was a significant human being. After her time here, she spent the next three decades doing similar things all across southern Michigan. After her, we get Alice Evans. She too had a prolific history before she became pastor at Ferndale Free Methodist. She was a missionary in Burundi for a very long time and then came back also in the later stages of uh, her 30s and took up the lead position of pastoring. However, she got married right as she was entering into her third year. And upon marriage, 
the title of pastor was given away to her husband because he was the one that was able to be ordained. I say all of this not to scorn any human beings, but I want to say this. She was a gifted pastor because as we continue to see her life and career, she continues to do all of these things wherever she is at. Now, I bring these pieces of information up not just as like really cool tidbits, but a little bit more pointed. This is a testimony that we can have. Women, may you be affirmed in your ministry. And I just want all of you to hear that. If we reflect on Ferndale Free Methodist, let us not forget that part of the reason we're so vibrant is because of the women in ministry that were here and that led. May you be emboldened, not only as you remember how people led, but as you continue to lead people to Christ and through the ministry of the church. This is why history is important. Because we can remember what happened so we can continue doing what God has called us to in the present. So here's part two. This is another thing that I found interesting. In the 1940s, there was a man by the name of Gilbert James in the Free Methodist Church who took an an exceptional interest in what it meant to be the whole church to the whole people in the United States. And because of that, he could not ignore the fact that African Americans did not have a place in the Free Methodist Church. He went down to Shreveport, Louisiana, and he started the Department of Interational Evangelism. And it was basically, in the 1940s, a church planting program for black Americans all across the United States, wherever he could find people that were willing and interested to participate. Interestingly enough, one of the places that he found people willing and interested to participate was Ferndale, Michigan. These are news clippings from the newspaper that he would write other people in the Free Methodist Church and beyond about the work that was happening. And we get some tidbits about what was happening in Ferndale. So if you can't read them, I'll I'll read, I'm gonna pull this off really quick. I'll read a couple of these. I don't know these names. I tried to find who these people were in records and they never showed up. But we have the Barbers and the Burrs and they are a group of lay people not ordained, that are very interested in doing the work of Jesus Christ among people who are being ignored and depressed. Sunday schools held in open air in summer, different homes in the winter. Astonishing that children continue year after year with no building. There are, no, there are now no barriers of antagonism, which is a great victory. We need more helpers and a church. For a number of years, a group of wonderful laymen from the Free Methodist Church of Detroit, Michigan, Ferndale area, have been carrying on a Sunday school program in a colored housing project just north of the city limits of Detroit. The attendance of this group on Sunday afternoon has been as high as 175, despite the fact that they do not have a building or a regular place of worship. These are people that were just interested in doing ministry with people, children especially, that were being ignored. Not just ignored, were being oppressed and were being discriminated against because of the color of their skin. And our Jesus is not okay with that. What's a testimony that we can have from this? Church, may each and every one of us be filled with a missionary zeal rooted in a holy, active love of God and neighbor that is modeled in bringing the transformational life of Jesus to the people the world hates, oppresses, and marginalizes. And this is lesson three. This is another interesting one that I came across. So... 
in the 1930s is when the small upstart Free Methodists moved to their church building. But unfortunately, that was also during the Great Depression. And so as they were moving in, securing their building, there was still the mortgage. And then the Great Depression happened and the bank failure happened, and none of the money was there for any of the people. But the banks made a deal. They told people who had credit in their banks, you can have this account and hope that you get money for it someday. Or, if you're willing, you can take that account and put it against the mortgage of the church. And many people did that. And the mortgage of the church was paid off at the height of the Great Depression. My Uncle Dave, and this is the beautiful thing about church history, my Uncle Dave, um, there is a, a rich family history that I own here and continue to own since the moment I walked in when I was a little child. And so to be able to share the stage with my kin is a gift. But he brought this up as well, and I think it's just an important thing to hammer home, that several members put their mortgages up as a collateral for the financing of this building. Put their money where their mouth is. Put their money where the convictions are. And then finally, if you've ever walked into the youth building, there's this plaque sitting there, often ignored, for fair reason, because you know, it's just sitting there. You know? But it's actually a, a really interesting little piece of history. If you can read it, it says, Ferndale Free Methodist Church gratefully acknowledges the gift of this youth building from Mr. and Mrs. Hugh A. White, whose lives of Christian service have been dedicated to the youth of this church and the Robert S. Marx Foundation. Now, that's not a name readily known, um, but there's a really rich history in what it means for how that building came about. Robert Marx um, was recognized as one of the most outstanding trial attorneys of his time. He was a World War I veteran. He was a college football star at the University of Cincinnati. He was a gifted educator, and he was a civil rights activist. He was also Jewish and held to his Jewish faith and identity. And he often represented clients against cases of anti-Semitism. One of the most influential cases was actually against Henry Ford. Look it up, it's really interesting. Um, after his death in 1960, his life savings went into a trust, the Marx Foundation. And it was set aside to give philanthropically to things that he thought, in his will, deserved money. Hugh A. White was willing to use his networks of giftedness and relationality to go across a boundary that seemed to be insurpassable. Why, why would this foundation be interested and willing to give money to a church building? Because it was for the community. Because it was something that was modeled as for the common good of the people that were around it. So from this one, a testimony that I see from part three here is, may we be filled with the spirit of Jesus as we continue to press on in obedience to the costly discipleship that he calls us to. May we seek the common good alongside others outside of our fold. But may we do so in a way that highlights our joyful commitment to Jesus. These are just three things that I found in the history of the, Free Method, of the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. There are many more. We could talk about the Light and Life radio, radio Hour that was started here in 1944 and ended up being syndicated across the globe by ABC. We could talk about the missions endeavor that was a wellspring of incredible things that happened from a people that sat in these pews that were willing for the gospel to go around the world through their mouth, through the way that they gave their money, through the way that they gave their time. There are so many things that we could stand here and talk about, but I just want to drive a point home, and it's this. B.T. Roberts, who's the 
primary founder of Free Methodism, said this about Free Methodism. The mission of the Free Methodist Church is twofold, to maintain the Bible standard of Christianity and to preach the gospel to the poor. As we look at the future and figure out what it means to be Ferndale Free Methodist Church, I want us to remember the past, if only for the reason to stoke a holy love in us that will not be quenched, a holy love that loves God passionately and that loves neighbors in a way that changes communities. And we can do this. Why can we do this? Because God promised himself to us. We are the church. We have the spirit of Jesus living in us. Who is to stop us? And so Ferndale Free Methodist Church, we get to celebrate we celebrate the wonderful things that God has done, and we look forward to a future that has a rich past to guide us in what we might be able to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. I'm so thankful for people who just have a gift of saying things really eloquently. And I just feel like Jacob did that so beautifully. So thank you for that. Um, most of us know our next speaker. She has been part of our church for many years. But what you may not know about her is the same day that she accepted Christ, she became a US citizen. The same day that she became a US citizen, she became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, which is such an incredible thing. And for the past 20 years, she has managed all of the custodial duties of our buildings and our grounds. She has diligently worked to make sure that our church is clean and tidy. She thinks of things that I never think to think of, like, who's clean the linens? That comes to her mind, and I am so thankful for that. <laughs> she continues the upkeep of all of our landscaping, gardening. That is a huge load to carry and she carries it so beautifully with her team and we are incredibly thankful for her and so privileged to have someone who here who cares so much for our church and would you join me in welcoming kem snyder i saw bryce uh, in the office this is supposed to turn down i think actually isn't it it might be better because i'm a shorty too no, I guess it doesn't. Okay. So I saw Bryce in the office and I said, hey, I guess I'm the salami between the two pieces of bread <laughs> because our next speaker is going to be a male too. So um, I'm here. I was asked to come and uh, tell why I came to Ferndale Free Methodist Church. And um, after two episodes of COVID, older age, and uh, a good knock on the head with 20 minutes of amnesia, my memory has begun to fail me a little bit, okay? So uh, I decided that probably would be very good to write this stuff down so that I didn't ramble on forever and ever. So um, I view coming to Ferndale Free Methodist Church for the first time on August 17, 1969, as a work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Um, I was not born in this church. Uh, many people think I'm a product of the youth program stuff. I'm really not, and you'll hear it. Now, I just want to say my story is a, an interesting one, I think, and um, I've seen, I've definitely felt the hand of the Lord uh, in my own coming to this church. But every single person sitting here who knows the Lord Jesus Christ has a story. And sometime you might want to write it down, because as you write it down and think, you will start to see things about the hand of God that maybe you didn't see at that time when you actually accepted the Lord. So, so much of what happened to bring me here is more than coincidental. I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of what I experienced. If you want the long version, talk to me personally sometime. Uh, these details were pivotal in the coming, in my coming to this particular church. So that's why I've got to go through this first. I am going to land the plane, though. Stick with me. In August 1969, I had no sense of purpose, meaning, or clear direction for my life. That may be the reason why I was taking a psychology class at Wayne State University. Surprisingly, and unusual for any class at this college, this instructor scheduled each student to have a personal interview with him as a class requirement. When my interview time arrived, I didn't know what to expect. After some general questions about my life, I shared that I had spent the previous summer in Greece. He used that as a springboard to talk about early Christianity in Greece, including Christian beliefs. 
This made me very guarded and very tense during the interview. I fancied myself as a committed atheist, but did not share this with him. I acted politely and interested. Fake it to make it, right? Okay, he offered me a book. Um, I, I wanted to get a really good grade in this course, so I wanted to you know, play it really cool. So I, uh, I acted politely and interested. He offered me a book by InterVarsity Press. I was eager to do anything to escape from the pressure of this interview, so I accepted the book with a nice false smile. I was so relieved when I finally walked out of his office holding the book. I remember looking up at the beautiful blue sky, and I don't know if anybody knows today, did you see how beautiful the blue sky was today? It was exceptional, and it reminded me as I got this uh, together that that was the way the sky looked when I walked out of that office. I had a very strange wandering thought pass through my mind. Was there really a God who cared personally about me? This thought seemed to come out of nowhere. However, I did not think at all about God after that thought. What I did think about was how the instructor seemed to have his life together in a way that I definitely did not. Sometime later, I learned that this instructor um, had recently experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit to engage with his students in a personal way to open up opportunities to witness to them. My class was the first class in which he started these personal interviews. Coincidence? I don't think so. I also did not know until later that he had asked a group at his church to pray specifically me, for me by name after his interview with me. Well, about almost two weeks passed since the horrible interview. And as I watched the instructor in class, I was feeling respect and admiration for him. There was something different about him. I wanted to get to know him better. I thought it would open up an opportunity if I told him I wanted to be a Christian, okay? So after class, I asked to talk to him and told him that I wanted to be one. Instead of expressing pleasure, he looked at me quite quizzically and asked me what I thought a Christian was. I didn't expect an interrogation and was not prepared for that one. I said, being like Jesus. The frown on his face told me that that was not the right answer. <laughs> then he asked if I had read the book he gave me. I answered no. He said, well, I suggest you go and read it. And then he just walked away. I felt so humiliated and was so angry, so angry. I thought, who do you think you are? I can be a Christian if I want to be, and I don't need to ask your permission. <laughs> this is all true. And out of spite, I did start to read that book. It was by InterVarsity Press. I could not stop reading. I had been quite disillusioned with life for some time, and I had no sense of hope inside of me. Life just seemed to be a continual, meaningless circle of living and dying with no purpose. The first four chapters in that book address the human dilemma and all the badness in the world. I had experienced some of this personally, so it really hit home. The book said that the suffering, sadness, and imperfection of the world and life in general were the result of something called SIN, capital S-I-N. I can remember thinking, why didn't anybody ever tell me about this before? Then in chapter five, it was the beautiful story of God's love and plan to deal with all this sin. I was alone that afternoon in August. I melted when I read about God's plan and love expressed in the death, death of Jesus to save humanity from this sin, over which humans had no power to save themselves. I can remember bowing my head and responding to a very deep and passionate longing and to a presence that I was experiencing very powerfully. I said to it, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you are, but I want you more than I've ever wanted anything else on this earth, and felt very, that's what I said. And that's how I became a Christian. I experienced a sense of peace and fullness and joy after I said that. That was August 13, 1969, late in the afternoon. The very next morning, August 14th on Thursday, I rushed to share this with the instructor. He was polite, but he felt I needed to look at some Bible verses, so he took me down the Roman road verses just to make sure that I'd done that conversion the right way, okay? <laughs> um, I was just so happy I did whatever he wanted me to do. He also took me to a store and purchased a Bible for me, but I didn't know anything about how to read it or anything. However, although I was experiencing a peculiar inner peace and joy, I was also experiencing a feeling of fear that I might somehow mess it up and it would not last. I had tried things like Buddhism and all kinds of weird stuff in my life. I shared these fears with the instructor. He confidently told me that when I gave my heart to God, I became his property 
and that God took very good care of his property. That truth has been a comfort to me over all these years, and how I came to the church is an example of God's loving care and provision in taking care of his property. He also recommended to me a course that was making the circles of churches during those days called Basic Youth Conflicts, because he said he thought it'd be a really good course for me to take to learn about what being a Christian really was, aside from the book. You know, I had, I had a little confusion with that, as you can see. So the next day, August 15th on Friday, out of nowhere, I had the thought that since I was now a Christian, I probably should start going to church. The Lord, uh, I don't know where that thought came from. Have a guess, okay? The Lord would need a church, the, uh, I would need a the Lord knew I would need a church family where there were mature believers who he could use to continue to impart his love to me and help me to grow in my knowledge of what a Christian believes and how a Christian behaves. Christianity is two things, believing and behaving. Um, I, um, the um, instructor recommended to me to take that, that course so that I would know also, not only the believing part, but the behaving part also. Um, I did not know where to go or how to start looking for a church, but God had already taken care of that. Several weeks before my conversion, a friend had arranged a blind date with a nice guy she knew from high school. She thought I was acting depressed and needed to perk up a bit. She did not know that this guy was a new convert to Jesus. On this date, all the guy did was talk about Jesus. We spent the whole date discussing why I was an atheist and why he was a Christian. I think we both knew this would be the first and last date. You can imagine his surprise when I called him August the 15th, which was a Friday, and asked him if he would take me to his church on Sunday. There was a very long silence that followed. As I did not have a car or even know how to drive, he took time off work to drive me. My first time at this church was August 17th, 1969. It was a service by Reverend Cleveland, and I will never forget the sermon. It hit so deeply as it was just, it was all about my life. I mean, it was just incredible. I sat there just stunned. Somewhere up here. I had to sit in the front, I think because of the whites. They sat in the front and I sat in the front too. They invited me to sit in the front. But that is another story. After the service, I asked to be baptized the next week as they were offering lakeside baptism. Coincidence? I don't think so. Uh, and then also, so, you know, surprisingly, this course that the professor told me to take on the basic youth conflicts, I found out that same day on my first Sunday that there was a small group going to Wheaton, Illinois to take the course. So I signed up for that too. And uh, this, um, this guy, you know, who talked about Jesus all the time, he was going too, and a couple of other people. So I had a ride down there. Um, God, you know, I, I, I just saw the hand of God later. I didn't even so much at the time, but even as time goes on, I see the hand of God so much in that. I wanted to come back to this church after my first visit. However, living in the inner city, I had a transportation problem, but the Lord worked this out also. The Lord put it into the hearts of Ruth and Glenn White to pick me up every Sunday morning from the state fairgrounds on Woodward, which was the last stop of the bus on the Woodward route. Then after church, they took me back to the fairgrounds to get the bus back home. They did this for two years, okay? And I think that Nancy Bergson was probably in the car too, and I mean, I, I never heard her utter or moan about all the extra time it took, but... Um, uh, and then they did this for two years until I was able to get a car of my own. I am forever grateful for their generosity and sacrifice. As a token of gratitude, I married their nephew, who also, <laughs> who also happened to show up at this church one day some decades ago for the wedding of their daughter, Nancy, who was his cousin. Okay. This is a shortened story of how I came to this church. There are many details I did not include for lack of time. My main purpose in sharing is to honor the Lord for how he has taken care of me, his property, and he'll take care of you that way too, okay? It's not just me. With all that happened, it's very difficult for me not to see the working of the Holy Spirit intentionally in bringing me here to this church, my church. This August 13th, 2024 will be the beginning of my 55th year at Ferndale. If you had told me that when I walked in, I probably would have dropped, I don't know. Not everyone has been able to have the same church for such a long time, but I am deeply grateful it was God's purpose and plan for me. I have no regrets about this. I have had seven pastors, some of whom have been involved in my life's happiest and saddest moments. I have sustained through several major conflicts, made precious friendships, honored to be chosen for leadership, access to problems and activities that satisfy my personal desire for meaning and purpose. I have been blessed by this church. This is the story of the, how the Holy Spirit led me here to be part of the body of Christ at Ferndale. 
I am grateful that my husband and I have the assurance from him that we are to continue to serve Lord Jesus at this church moving forward. Thank you so much. And if you want the longer version, just talk to me sometime. All right, thank you, Kim. Our God is not a God of coincidences, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, our next speaker is Pastor Bryce Carafa. Bryce has been at Ferndale Free Methodist from the very beginning of his life. Again, carried in. Today we let him walk. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he went here from birth all the way through his junior year, and then he moved to Maryland for his senior year, came back to Michigan, attended Spring Arbor University, and graduated with a degree in youth ministry. Bryce has been here serving as our youth pastor since 2020, and it won't take you long to find out that some of Bryce's favorite things are disc golf, history, teens, and the study of God's word. So would you join me in welcoming Bryce Carfa? Thank you. Well, as I was introduced, I am the youth pastor. And as youth pastor, I acknowledge that I walk in the shoes of those on staff who have come before me. And so I'd like to acknowledge um, our past staff members and our current staff members who are at Ferndale, who have been at Ferndale, who came today. And so I'd like to acknowledge you. You don't have to stand. I'm not going to make you stand. I just want to acknowledge you as you're here. Okay, I'm making you stand. Stand up. You're getting bossed around. Here we go. All right, Al Mellinger. Tom Jacobs. Jacob Tenney, Scott Gentry. I'm going to make our current people stand too. Rob Daniels, Laura Riddle. I'm already standing, but I want to also recognize the uh, the more important staff people on church, the church secretaries. Um, yes, we have one former Elsa Tenney is here. And one current Kay Willis is here as well. I want to recognize that they have lived an example for me to follow in ministry, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. But I want to show you a picture here, um, just to show you that, yes, I was carried in. Right here. This is, uh, this is my baby dedication. Oh, it's a little dark. Um, but... Uh, that's me in the white. I was a, a large baby. I'm sorry. I'm being held by uh, my mom, Vicki, uh, with my dad, Jeff, looking on. Uh, Pastor Scott is uh, hiding out in that shadow over there. Uh, and my uncle, Dale Woods, is also on stage. And if you don't know what a child dedication is, which I, I think most of you do, but I want to remind us, um, in a child ded dedication... Parents bring a child to dedicate them to the Lord. And they're asked a couple of questions. I have, uh, I'm very thankful that Scott gave me what he had because this is probably the service that I was given, the questions my parents were asked. The, question, the first question, do you, in the presence of God in this church, solemnly dedicate this child to the Lord? My parents said, we do, thank you. Will you endeavor to live a life before this child that will give witness to your faith in Jesus Christ? I can tell you they did. Do you accept the authority of the Old and New Testaments as the word of God? I can tell you they do. Out of them, will you endeavor diligently to teach this child the commandments and promises of the Most High God so that your child may, come, or may early come to a personal faith in Jesus Christ? I can tell you they did. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. But right here in this, the next thing says... Um, Congregation, you have a responsibility. And so there were questions asked to the congregation as well, because I'm not where I am just because of my parents. They did a really great job, but they didn't do it alone. These questions would be asked then to the congregation. By being present in God's house today, do you hereby declare yourselves to be the children of God because you trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life? If this is true, please respond by saying, we do. And the church responded, we do. And then, having come freely, 
I ask now that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you. And I'm going to fill my name in because I'm talking about me. I now ask that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you, so that Bryce may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you vow, by God's help, to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ, to help Jeff and Vicki be faithful to God, and to help teach and train Bryce in the ways of the Lord so that he might one day trust him as Savior and Lord? If you accept this responsibility, please respond by saying, we do. And you vocally, thank you, yeah. You vocally responded, we do, and in action throughout my life, you have responded, we do. I have been blessed to see a a great host of witnesses in this church, those who have taught me, those who still teach me. That's the best part about coming back. I'm going to call Ma Tenney out here. Ma Tenney was one of my youth sponsors, and now I get to work with her. And she taught me in youth group, and she teaches me now. Right? Kelly and Craig Satterfield were Sunday school teachers for me. And Ralph Shelley, Sunday school teachers for me. And I get to learn from them now. It is a blessing to be able to come back and have that just presence with people who truly follow God. You know, part of of this charge to the congregation is saying, we, we need you as a congregation to encourage and pray for this family. And I know in a hundred years, you've done that for many children, but I'm talking about me. And I know there are people who have prayed for me, who have encouraged my parents, who have prayed even when they didn't know me. When I came back, when I was announced as youth pastor, and my first Wednesday night, um, a sweet couple, Jim and Anita Brown, came up to me um, and my mom and told me, I'm going to cry. I love this story. They came up to me and told me that their first, one of their first Sundays was our family's last Sunday. And on our last Sunday, before we moved to Maryland, we were right here in front and surrounded in prayer. And they said, we don't know who they are, but we know that this is a church. Mom, you're making me cry. I'm going to stay over here. (laughs) And they said, we don't know, we didn't know who you were, but we knew that if a church would pray for a family like this leaving, we needed to pray for them as well. And they did. They prayed for us. And when we came back, they said, we didn't know why we were praying for you, but we were praying for our future youth pastor. And it was just so sweet and encouraging. And so even now, even though they weren't present when I was dedicated, they were encouraging and praying for me. And so as I celebrate 100 years of God's faithfulness to do marvelous things here at Ferndale, I celebrate 26 years of God's faithfulness to me through the lives of you, congregation at Ferndale for Methodist. Thank you. As a children's pastor, that's such a beautiful thing to see and to know. And what a privilege it is to pray over the children of our church, both as a group and by name. And I see that both in myself, but also in the volunteers who have served so tirelessly over the years in serving our children. They, um, they pray for your kids too. So if you've had a kid who's raised here, know that there is a church family, as Pastor Bryce said, that, that prays over these kids. So... Are, um, and, and we see the fruit of that because of those prayers and their tireless efforts in serving here. So our last speaker of the day is our lead pastor, Pastor Rob. He has been our lead pastor since 2023. So very recent, but he and his wife, Ruthie, came here from Seattle, Washington, and we as a church are just so incredibly blessed to have him here. He has an evident heart for the Lord, an evident heart for prayer, and we are just incredibly thankful for him. So would you join me in welcoming Pastor Pastor Rob Daniels. The first thing I want to say is just 
Thank you all for making this a priority uh, to come back and to celebrate um, Centennial anniversary. And um, it is a significant um, event in ways that are too numerous to get into. But you need to know, churches celebrating a centennial, it's very rare. It is extremely rare. And the fact that uh, you are part of the story um, is what makes it even that much more special. Something I want to be uh, aware of is I know uh, that there are folks who have made the events of this weekend happen, uh, the events of today that have happened, and I know um, that it's made for a long day. And with that in mind, I do want to make a little bit of an adjustment uh, to what I want to share uh, with you uh, this afternoon. Um, it's quite clear uh, from uh, what we've seen to uh, what's been talked about and what's been shared. Ferndale has changed um, over the years. There are lots of things that have changed. Uh, there are things that are continuing to be different uh, in a lot of different ways. But I have to tell you this, something I've noticed since I've been here and have had the opportunity to serve here. There's one thing that I see that has not changed uh, here at Ferndale. And it's this. I observe and see a church that is focused on lifting up a Savior who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 6 through 8, we read these words. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That said, FFMC must continue to look to do in the future what it has clearly done in the past. The one thing I've read about and seen is a legacy, even demonstrated today, a legacy of impacting the lives of others. And this reminds me of a story that I came across from Pastor Ken Shigemutsu. And he tells a story about his friend and his mentor. You may have heard this name, Leighton Ford. And Leighton Ford was ambitious for God. He wanted to have a significant impact. And after graduating from Wheaton College, he wed Billy Graham's sister, Jeannie. Now, you're going to be pretty significant. You marry Billy Graham's sister. And he became a part of what was basically the royal family of the Christian world. He was a rising star. And Leighton began preaching in large football stadiums all around the world. And he was named Clergyman of the Year. And Time magazine identified him as the person most qualified to succeed his brother-in-law, Billy Graham. And Leighton's Ford son had become an accomplished track and field athlete. And like his father, he too aspired to become a minister of the gospel. And unexpectedly, he was diagnosed with a rare heart disease that caused arrhythmia. And after an operation to address this condition, Sandy seemed to be fine. But then, while running, shortly after his 21st birthday, the arrhythmia struck again. And a few days later, Sandy Ford passed away on an operating table. A few days after Sandy's funeral, Leighton went to Sandy's room near the university to gather his son's belongings. He looked over Sandy's desk and Leighton found an unfinished poem. It was titled To Dad for His 50th Birthday. And what a golden honor, Leighton's son Sandy said, it would be to, donder, to don your mantle, to inherit twice times your spirit. For then you 
would be me and I could continue to be you. Leighton wept when he read that. He thought of the mantle that would never fall on his son's shoulder. But amid his pain and loss, Leighton sensed the Holy Spirit calling him to begin a new ministry, one that would mean stepping out of the limelight. And he felt led to invest himself in a small group of younger men and women to help them run their race for God through one-on-one spiritual mentoring. Leighton Ford is now in his 90s, and he's been blessed with many sons and daughters. He's no longer the A-list celebrity that he had once sought to be, but his influence is deep and it's wide. And he is now truly content with his life and his calling. As Sandy's poem foretold, the mantle of Leighton's ministry has fallen, but not on Sandy, but on his many sons and daughters that he never thought he would influence like he ultimately did. That is the story of Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Friends and family, as FFMC continues to look to the future, the transformative truth is that we serve a Savior who does not change. His word endures and his love endures forever. And Ferndale FMC, it will be different in many ways, but in ways that touch and change lives, Ferndale will never change. We're going to continue to worship. I'm going to invite our worship team to come and lead us uh, as we continue to remember the faithfulness of our God as he's continued to impact the world through Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Let's worship together. I would also like to invite those from the past who have sang on our worship team to come on up and sing with us. We're going to sing uh, Victory in Jesus, so you should know it. So come on up. I can see some people. Yep. <laughs> Here we go. Four seventy-three. I heard an old story of a Savior came in glory. How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning And I repented of my sins And lost the victory Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. His precious power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and calls the blind to see and I am right dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and 
sums we are Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angel sea. Redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Before you walk out the back door, Kim. Kim, Kimberly Sessions, along with a few other people, and I'm not exactly sure who those folks are. Come on up here, please. I know Kelly has been part of this. Um, if you have been part of this, please come on up here. Organizing and, and planning and plotting. Who else? I know they're not the only ones. I know there's other. Yeah, come on up here. Come on. Who? Teresa, where are you? Uh, come on up here. Now, here's the thing, right? We read in Scripture that, you know, we need to be mindful that we don't let our glory go to our heads or whatever. The fact of the matter is, these guys and from us, they, they need to be lifted up because they have done tremendous work in making all of this, all of these things happen. So I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. They have worked so hard. Please. Yes. Thank you all. And please, as you have an opportunity, I know that they'll probably... I'm probably going to get clocked for this, but <laughs> please come and tell them, share with them your appreciation as well um, as we uh, wrap up this time today. I'm really hoping that um, I'm really hoping that you you fully grasp the impact that this church has had on people, and not just nameless people. This church has had an impact around the world you have and you need you need to know that and um, thank you thank you all and we're going to close in prayer uh, for our time this afternoon so let's just pray and together okay let's pray God thank you for um, what you have done it's been a marvelous thing uh, through the story of Ferndale Free Methodist Church. And God, the really incredible thing about what you've done is that the story is not over. You continue to write your story. Father, we ask that as we continue to be your presence in this place, that the message of Jesus and his love will go forth. 
continuing to impact lives and to change eternal destinies. And now, God, we uh, ask that uh, you would be with us as we continue uh, to spend time together. Lord, that our time of fellowship would continue to be sweet. Lord, and that you would be honored in everything that is said and done. We love you. We are grateful for this 100 years. Lord, may the next 100, Lord, be even more glorious. We pray this in your son's name. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you. Thank you all.